This is Berkeley Voices, a UC Berkeley News podcast. I'm Ann Bryce. For a long time, paleontologists thought that the famous, long-extinct apex predator, the Tyrannosaurus rex, may have chased its prey at high speeds. Children's books and movies often showed them sprinting at a terrifying pace. You might remember scenes from the 1993 film Jurassic Park, in which a massive T-Rex chases characters who are escaping in a jeep that they're driving as fast as it can go. Come on, come on, come on, come on. We've got to get out of here. We've got to get out of here. Now, now, right now. Let's go, go, go. Let's go. Hey. Start the engine. But in the past few decades, paleontologists have found that this wasn't exactly accurate. And it's one of a number of ideas we've long held about these ancient creatures that are being reshaped by modern science. After a really sort of ground through thing, you know, how much bone and muscle needs to be on the animal to reach a particular speed, you know, with enough power, people realize that, you know, Tyrannosaurus probably didn't run more than, you know, 20, 25 miles an hour. Jack Sang is a UC Berkeley vertebrate paleontologist and a functional morphologist. He studies the relationship between an organism's physical structure and its function in the environment. He says paleontologists figured out that T. rexes were actually kind of slow compared to what they once thought by studying living bipedal birds like chickens and ostriches. Because paleontologists can't study the soft tissues of extinct animals, for example, their muscles or their digestive physiology, they rely instead on living animals, like birds, crocodiles, and mammals, to provide clues. Paleontologists have to to have one foot in the living world and sort of look at how animals today function. Uh, so we have a lot in common with you know people who study the, the engineering of animals, uh, the biomechanics of animals, the, the kinematics, the movements of animals. The more paleontologists learn and discover, the more their understanding of how dinosaurs lived changes and transforms. In the past few decades, with the advance of imaging technology and the ability to share research across the globe, Paleontologists have made leaps in their knowledge of prehistoric animals. And it's changing the popular images we hold about what dinosaurs looked like and how they lived. And those findings, Tseng says, also hold powerful lessons for what it means to imagine our Earth millions of years in the future. In the Department of Integrative Biology, Associate Professor Sang teaches a handful of classes related to paleontology, including life during the age of dinosaurs. One of his lectures is about sauropods. You know, the huge plant-eating dinosaurs with the super long necks. In the lecture, Sang discusses a working recent hypothesis about how these gigantic animals, which were the biggest to ever walk the earth, were able to take in adequate oxygen through their necks, which could reach lengths of up to 50 feet. And, and it really started with looking at animals that were doing extreme things, whether it's birds or mammals, you know, cheetahs having to run really fast or, or antelopes having to run really fast. You know, what do animals, how do animals adapt uh, physiologically, you know, to, to needing this kind of you know, elevated air supply? And they found that many birds, the only living dinosaurs today, have hollow bones not just to make them lighter for flight, but also around their lungs, allowing them to expand their aerobic capacity more than they could otherwise. And sauropods had a similar hollowness in the bones of their vertebral columns, which many paleontologists now believe acted as kind of pseudo-lung systems, helping them get enough oxygen down their necks all the way to their lungs. So there, there are these you know, more examples of you know, how we can really start to conclude sort of seemingly impossible you know, inferences about extinct animals just by understanding how living animals work, really sort of creating this bridge to, to go from biology to paleontology. Uh, so in some ways, you know, we can sort of make conjectures about you know, just 
a, a more uh, specialized breathing system in sauropods, but in some ways we also do not know exactly how they function because there's, in many cases, no living analog. So, so we sort of walk this fine line of you know inferring uh, extinct uh, lifestyles based on what we know, but uh, sometimes fossil animals go beyond <laughs> modern limits. So, so you no, know, that's still very much a black box for a lot of paleontology. At his office in the campus's Valley Life Sciences building, Tseng is showing me and a colleague of mine who writes a lot about dinosaurs, Bob Sanders, some fossil replicas that Tseng uses in his teaching. This guy just crops and swallows, whereas that crops and chews. Yes, exactly. So so two different solutions to, to dealing with vegetation. Uh, and the building houses the well, university's the Museum of Paleontology. It holds one of the largest paleontological collections of any university museum in the world. So this is one that's pretty popular in children's books. It's the Plotocus. This is one of the large dinosaurs. We don't have the whole skeleton. Uh, we have an example of uh, the skull. Uh, and you wouldn't be able to tell the size of the whole animal from the skull because these dinosaurs, uh, sauropodomorph dinosaurs, right, the largest of the dinosaurs, tend to have small heads for their body size. So, so the head itself can be deceiving. Uh, While most of the collection is open only for research, there is a huge replica of a T-Rex in the lobby right when visitors walk in. It's one of the most complete T-Rex skeletons ever reconstructed. And this replica is nicknamed Osborne. Uh, this specimen was originally discovered in, in Montana in the Hell Creek Formation, which is a, a rock formation that's famous for producing lots and lots of dinosaurs. Uh, the in a lot of books, most dinosaurs look kind of like dull-colored giant lizards. They're often scaly and in muted shades of brownish green. But in the past several decades, says Sang, paleontologists around the world have uncovered dinosaur bones with feathers around them, representing species they didn't realize were feathered before, including tyrannosaurs, the group of predatory dinosaurs that the T-Rex belonged to. So you will see in, in some uh, paleoartistic reconstructions, furry T-Rex, right? Uh, and, and that you know, may or may not have been true uh, for, for all life stages of uh, a T-Rex, for example, but you know, we think it's likely that at least at one point in their lives, they probably had a body that's partially or completely covered in feathers. So, so that you know, fundamental change in how we think about the appearance of dinosaurs really started with you know, on-the-ground, field, research-based discoveries. Wow, that's crazy. I mean, it changes how I think about them, you know? Yeah, yeah. To me, uh, feathers, and, and there's no ongoing research into not only, you know, what types of feathers will cover some of these dinosaurs, but, but also the coloration, right? Imagining dinosaurs not as the scaly reptile, reptilian, you know, animals, but I mean, they are reptiles, but, but additionally, maybe they're, they're more like modern birds, you know, uh, which are among the most extravagant animals in terms of the types of you know, colors and, and you know, feathered uh, shapes and sizes, you know, they, they can sport on their bodies. So, so it really sort of, you know, brings the, the biology back into to what used to be a very sort of, you know, bone and death centered field, uh, which is, you know, these animals are long dead and we're only looking at their bones, uh, but with, you know, Soft tissue preservation, uh, like skin, uh, and, and in other cases, feathers, that we can start to literally flesh out these animals. To complicate our image of the T. rex even more, some researchers posit that T. rexes were actually scavengers instead of active hunters, based in part on the preservation of tooth bite and scratch marks on fossils of their potential prey. Sang has studied the bite mechanics of Jane, a juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex, to learn more about the forces involved in biting prey. I think it, there's no doubt that you know these animals were were carnivores. Uh, they probably were not eating vegetables, but they were eating the vegetarians. Mm -hmm. uh, and that you know, modern scavengers, as, as we understand them, you know, tend to go for you know carcasses. I mean, they're not really fresh oftentimes. So they're either decomposing or really sort of hardened because of it's sort of jerky, naturally jerky. Uh, and that involves different forces uh, and, and sort of, you know, sharpness of the teeth. Yeah. Versus an active predator, you know, going after moving prey uh, and, and potentially having access to fresh 
tissues. So that those, those different behaviors would change you know, how the teeth were potentially used, uh, or what kind of adaptation they would have required, you know, for them to, to do those things. My gosh, if they didn't hunt and they just ate, they were scavengers, that would change. That would blow everyone's mind. Yeah, that would be very disappointing <laughs> for a lot of kids, for sure. Every kid in the world's like. Oh. I think paleontology is unique among the sciences in that, you know, this shift over the years, over the decades and centuries of sort of evolving paleontological knowledge is not only captured in a scientific record, it's also captured in the popular record. If you look at books from 50 years ago, right, they, they posture dinosaurs very differently from the way we would do it today. Uh, and it's this constant sort of uh, profusion of new scientific knowledge into the popular you know, psyche that that really is recorded in in children's books, which is you know a lovely way to sort of see how this science has progressed. Right? It's not the dinosaurs are still the same dinosaurs, but but the way we understand them as living animals have changed dramatically over the past you know, several decades. In November, paleontologists in Siberia made a groundbreaking discovery. They unearthed the first known mummy of a saber-toothed cat. It's a three-week-old cub from the Ice Age. Although it's missing its bottom half and hadn't developed its canine teeth yet, it's a remarkable find, says Sang. By studying its soft tissue, scientists can glean clues about the relationship between where the muscles and the skin sit relative to the bone and how that might have shaped its movements, like its hunting style. It's really, you know, in a sense, you know, a quantum leap in information content. Uh, and, and in the case of paleontology, you know, that may be more easily done. It, all it takes is one amazing specimen to sort of blow our minds, you know, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, and that, to me, it remains sort of the allure of paleontology is, you know, despite all the, the technology we have today, to, which is great, you know, to really sort of take a fresh look at what we already have in these in collections. There is still space. There is still, you know, uh, importance of field work. Uh, and, and in that sense, you no, know, we still do field work today in very much the same ways that paleontologists did field work 100 years ago, right? We, we don't have, you know, scanners where we can just say, okay, I, I know exactly where the fossils are underground and we're just going to dig in one spot, right? It still takes years of experience, still takes heavy dosage of luck. To, to even find, you know, any fossil, let alone, you know, bunnies and incomplete skeletons. So I think, you know, that's, that's a very sort of, you know, equalizing part of paleontology is, you know, if you put in the effort, if you <laughs> just spend putting your time, uh, anybody, right, from, from the, the beginning, from a, a vocational paleontologist to a professional paleontologist, anybody can make amazing discoveries. We are naturally curious about our, the world around us. And especially if it's something that's, you know, that can seem so alien because, you no, know, these are, are gigantic or are really shaped animals uh, on land and in the ocean that we no longer have today. Uh, but on the other hand, they, they actually lived, breathed, and, and eventually died on the same planet that we call home today. Uh, so there is that just fundamental thirst for, for understanding our place on this planet and what came before us. Singh says there are also increasingly practical aspects of paleontology that can be applied to what we're facing as a species today with climate change. In paleontology, everything has already happened, he says. So dinosaurs and other animals and many plants went extinct, and it's recorded in the rocks for us to study. We know the outcomes of evolutionary history. But, he says, we don't necessarily know how they got to that point. And fossils of vertebrates like dinosaurs, fish, and mammals, but also especially of plants and invertebrates like mollusks, hold a lot of these clues. The questions we ask of them have to do with you know, how different species uh, sometimes survive, others go extinct, how they adapt to environmental changes, you know, warming and cooling cycles, habitat disturbances, uh, or dispersals of species from one continent to, to another. Uh, and all of these are also sort of similar questions uh, that 
today, you know, global change biologists are trying to answer is how do we understand the role of species in different environments? Uh, so in a way, you know, paleontology is sort of, you know, pre-adapted to plug into to understanding the future of Earth because, you know, we have billions of years of the fossil record to, to learn from. Mm -hmm. It's um, for me thinking about, you know, learning about how frogs can adapt to different um, changes in temperature in the water or just diff these different things ways that animals have been adapting. It it makes me, even if humans die out, which I'm assuming we probably will, but um, uh, it, it makes me hopeful that the, other, the animals will survive and that the earth will continue. <laughs> uh, so, so that is also, I agree with you. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I, you know, one part of me sort of is, is imagining uh, a future where, you know, if, indeed the, the, the human species goes extinct uh, i hope that paleontology does not go extinct so so future paleontologists you know not the human species maybe another species will someday look back and see our fossil record so that the tiny slice of time in which our species lived on this earth and and it's it, it makes you think about what they are going to see when all is said and done are they going to see a species that that drove ourselves to extinction? Are they going to see one that actually managed somehow to coexist, you know, with other life on earth and maybe even, you know, improving things and, and, you know, creating new biodiversity. Uh, so, so that, that to me is kind of sobering to think about. Uh, uh, and the fact that even though today, as far as we know, right, the human species is the only one capable of you know, doing science, right? Recording history, essentially taking a record of what has happened around us, what we're doing, you know, to change the world around us. Uh, we may be the first one on this planet, but we might not be the last. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that's really cool to think about. I'm Anne Bryce, and this is Berkeley Voices, a UC Berkeley news podcast from the Office of Communications and Public Affairs at UC Berkeley. This was the third episode of our eight-part series on transformation. New episodes of the series come out on the last Monday of each month. We also have another show, Berkeley Talks, that features lectures and conversations at UC Berkeley. You can find all of our podcast episodes with transcripts and photos on UC Berkeley News at news.berkeley.edu slash podcasts.